Greetings. We are now in the final month of the ecclesiastical year as I'm speaking. And uh, normally we say <clears throat> this is the, uh, uh, I'm speaking in an intercalary year, so we have the second month of Adar, the 13th month this particular <coughs> year. And uh, we have a saying, Mishanichnas Adar Marbim Besimcha, that when the month of Adar enters, we, we our joy increases. But right now, of course, uh, we are grieving uh, for the situation in the Ukraine. And, of course, I would ask those of you who are hearing me during the time of this crisis to continue to pray about that situation. You know, we who are a part of, uh, we who are, are, are people who take the Bible seriously, we understand that even in the world of religion, there can be problems, of course. <laughs> and uh, in the Church of God, there can be problems. We're told uh, in Revelation, there are seven churches there, and we're told to listen to what is said to those seven churches. They had strengths, and five of them also, uh, with five of them, weaknesses are discussed uh, of the seven. And finally, uh, we conclude with the message that I, I believe you'll find to each of the seven as you go through it. I want to go to the conclusion of the passage, Revelation 3.21. To, uh, well, let's go to verse, uh, right at verse 30, 22. He, well, I'll, I'll start with 21. Well, well, that's positive. Why not? To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there were messages to the churches, messages of encouragement, and messages of correction. Today I want to talk about problems in the religious realm. Problems in the religious realm. Now I want to talk about a couple of, of things from last week, if, if I may. Uh, some of you who saw uh, the last message that I gave will notice that I turned to 1 Kings 15, and I wanted to turn to verse 24, but instead I turned to verse 34. So, uh, you know, it was embarrassing, but let me go back to 1 Kings 15, 24, what I should have read. I talked about Jeroboam, how he took over after the death of, of Asa, using uh, English pronunci American pronunciation. In, verse 15, in, in 1 Kings 15, 24, so Asa rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. So 1 Kings 15, 24. So I'll make that correction. And one other thing I want to talk about regarding this King Jehoshaphat, whom I discussed last week. And I'm grateful for the response. And, and uh, if you haven't seen that message, I hope you go back there. I think I called it Lessons from a Royal Biography. You know, we obviously the career of Jehoshaphat is in the Bible for us to learn uh, from 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 the uh, from from his biography, but in talking about him, in uh, first in Second Chronicles, the seventeenth chapter in the sixth verse, we see according to what the Bible says here. Second uh, Chronicles seventeen and verse six. And his heart took delight in the ways of the Eternal. This is talking about Jehoshaphat. Moreover, he removed the high places and wooden images from Judah. So the consensus, it seems to be, uh, seems among the scholars, is that this is talking about the idolatrous uh, worship that was going on here and there, hither and yon, uh, in Judah. He got rid of that. <clears throat> but evidently what he didn't get rid of were, were people worshiping the true God of the Bible, but doing so uh, hither and yon in, 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 in temple-like ways, you know, temple-type rituals that were, were supposed to be only done in the temple itself. Uh, you know, there was one central sanctuary for those types of rituals, and evidently there were people worshiping God, but doing so <laughs> more or less on their terms, you could say. So I go to the 20th chapter of uh, Second Chronicles and to the 33rd verse. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. So the consensus seems to be that um, he took away the idolatrous high places, but couldn't stamp out, you know, these various 
high places where people performed uh, temple-like rituals that were supposed to be restricted to the central sanctuary. So that's a, a possible way to understand uh, those two verses. You know, so he came close, <laughs> you know, to doing uh, to everything that was right, but didn't quite make it, you know. But nevertheless, overall, he has a positive report. Uh, and yes, there, there can be local places uh, of prayer and, and study, of course, but it's not the same as the temple ritual. That was unique to the temple. For example, in Psalm 20, 74 and verse 14, you see there are ga various gathering places where people can come together and have fellowship and have, have prayer and study. I go to Psalm 74 and verse 14. Uh, I'm sorry, a little bit uh, earlier than that. Um, it talks about the persecution. Uh, let's go to verse 7. Uh, here, here that talks about the sanctuary, the temple. They have set fire to sanctuary. They have defiled filed the dwelling place of your name to the ground. And then in verse 8, though, goes on. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them altogether. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. So there were other places, obviously, where people met for prayer, for instruction. It wasn't the temple. The temple was unique. But there were other places to meet for prayer instruction. If you look at the Old King James translation, the, these Moadim, these appointed places, there are appointed times and appointed places. And uh, in, in the Old King James, it says, uh, more or less, they burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. That's how the term they use there. So as, I, as I'm saying, it's okay to have, obviously, local places to gather together, uh, but there's the rituals of the temple were unique to the temple and uh, that's the way it should be today too the uh, the types of things that went on in the temple in Jerusalem you know, go on in the temple in Jerusalem right now they can't go on uh, in the millennium they will uh, so that's a, a little bit of uh, uh, adjustment uh, you know or further further elaboration uh, to what I covered last week and that might might be a segue to what I have to cover today because I covered the career of Jehoshaphat, and he generally had it right, but he made some mistakes. And as I said, there are problems, as we all know, there are problems in the religious realm, even, even among those who are the chosen, who are uh, the first fruits, who are, who are the church of God. Uh, the book of Revelation um, has correction for the church, uh, as we know if we've read that section of Revelation 2 and 3. So I want to talk about problems in the religious realm. <clears throat> and if it, I go a little longer than normal, so be it. We'll see how, how, how it goes. Uh, the first problem I want to talk about is the problem of personality cult. You know, the, the, in the world of, 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 in the spiritual realm, we, we, of course, are dealing with the greatest issues of life. We're dealing with our eternal life, our salvation. So obviously those who are shepherding us those who are guiding us and leading us, <clears throat> uh, as we as we follow them, uh, we might have a tendency to elevate them uh, and 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 virtually deify them, and and uh, that is that is uh, unhealthy for them. It's un it's unhealthy for them, and it's and it's unhealthy uh, for for us if we do it, and it can lead it can lead to uh, to distortions, you know, because. Uh, Anybody can make a mistake, uh, you know, whoever it may be. Um, and uh, I want to go to 1 Corinthians 11, what, what the Apostle Paul says about that. 1 Corinthians 11, he, he uh, of course, discusses uh, how we should behave towards, towards uh, the church, towards others outside the church, and, and how we should conduct our lives. And then he mentions, finally, in, in a summary of it, uh, you have to go back to chapter 10 and how it ends. Then in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, he says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. You know, so we, we, follow, we follow Paul as he, uh, we, if he were alive today, we would follow Paul as he follows Christ. And uh, in the book of Ephesians, he tells us, 
even a very, in a very important matter, such as honoring our parents. You know, we, you don't honor your parent if, if your parent is, is trying to teach you to, to, let's say, to become a criminal. Uh, you know, then you'd say, sorry, uh, mom, mom and dad, you know, that I'm not going that route. Uh, uh, look at what, it, again, in Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. So obey your parents in the Lord. I want to go back to uh, Psalm 146. Psalm 146. And here we're told in verse 3, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his plans perish. So, yes, we should respect as Paul tell, as as the book as the Bible tells us, we should greatly respect those who are who are our spiritual shepherds, uh, but we don't want to develop into a personality cult. This can lead to problems during the life of the individual, and then even after the death of the individual, it can lead to problems uh, if we don't want to make corrections corrections and adjustment adjustments because because uh, we don't want to do anything different than what that individual taught us. As I said, we follow our leaders as they as as they follow uh, the the lead of, of of Jesus Christ. You know, as as they uh, as they follow the Bible, we we follow them. Uh, we, now, regarding a personality cult, another problem in, in in the religious realm that a lot of you probably are aware of and experienced, and maybe some of us even unfortunately were were uh, guilty of it one time or another, and that is abuse of authority. Uh, abuse of authority. Uh, you find that, of course, uh, in the Old Testament, condemned in many places. And last week, in fact, I made a mistake regarding that. Um, I conflated a couple of, of Psalms, you know, uh, or a couple of, of chapters of the Bible. You know, Jeremiah 23 condemns uh, leaders who, who abuse authority, as does Ezekiel 34, as does Matthew 23, and as the Psalm 82 and also Psalm 94. Now last week I think I said Psalm 23 when I meant Psalm 94 because I had all these 23's in my mind. But Psalm 94 which is the Psalm for uh, recited every Wednesday in the temple uh, according to, 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 what, to what we understand, what we know. You know this, the Wednesday Psalm, uh, the Tuesday Psalm is Psalm 82 and the Wednesday Psalm is Psalm 94 and it warns about those who are in positions of authority who are abusing their authority. and. Um, in Matthew 23, uh, we see that example. The spiritual leaders in Jesus' day, in Matthew 23 and verse 4, Matthew 23 and verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens, uh, uh, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They're making life difficult for people, these leaders. And you know, you'll, you'll often find that the leaders who do this, who throw their weight around like this, are not following their own rules. They're demanding of you, the congregation, you, the community, to follow these rules. But they're, you know, they're uh, on, on a different level. You know, they're the exception. You know, rules are made for others, not for themselves. So, and that that's a danger. Yes, it's a danger in the political realm. And, you know, but it's, it's, it's a danger in, in many realms. But I'm speaking today of the religious realm, and it is a danger in the religious realm. So personality cult and, and uh, abuse of authority. Another danger in the uh, realm, in the religious realm, is ignoring human nature. Ignoring human nature. Again, we have to have communities, we have to be organized, and we need to have a ministry, and the ministry needs to, to be respected. And we understand, we, there are a lot of verses on that, that of course I could quote, uh, and, and have quoted, and God willing will quote. But uh, at the same time, we cannot ignore human nature. So even ministers are human, and can make mistakes, and can even sin. So there does need to be uh, a... Uh, a church needs to have a way of dealing with that. A community needs to have a way of appropriately dealing with that problem. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20. For there is not a just man 
on earth who does good and does not sin. There's nobody perfect. No, there's nobody sinless. Jesus Christ, yes, was sinless. <laughs> He's the only one. And um, so we, we, we have to realize, you know, human nature is what it is. So your pastor should be respected, of course. He gets up in the morning. He puts his pants on one leg at a time, like 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 other men in the congregation, you know. And and uh, and he has to be careful, as the apostle Paul said about himself. And so we have and we have to keep this in mind. Um, I want to go to Galatians, the second chapter and the eleventh verse. If you're re if you're going along with me, and some of you are perhaps or will later, uh, look at these references. Go to uh, Galatians two, and verse eleven. Galatians two. And verse 11. And uh, here the Apostle Paul is talking about the Apostle Peter. Now, the Apostle Peter, as you know, is one of the great figures in all of human history. And, and, and here's what the Apostle Paul says in, in, uh, in uh, Galatians 2, verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. So the Apostle Paul, you know, he, he of course was an apostle, so he could confront Peter face to face because he was to be blamed. He, he had made a mistake serious enough to, for Paul to record it here. And you can read on as to what, what the problem was. But, you know, if Peter could make a mistake, and Paul's upset about himself in 1 Corinthians 9.27, that he was capable of, 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 of possibly sinning, then we have to realize that people can sin, even even people that are spiritual leaders. So in a, in a spiritual community, in, in, a, in, a, in an ecclesia, you know, in an ecclesiastical community, there needs to be a proper way of dealing with, with that kind of a problem. Uh, another problem that uh, is very important a very important problem in the, in, in the religious realm is the problem of freezing time, being frozen in time. Uh, for some reason, in the world of religion, there seems to be this idea that, that the older is, is always to be preferred uh, and, and the new is always to be, to be suspected. You know, this was something that uh, the Jewish community dealt with uh, it, it, it became, uh, I don't want to go into all the ins and outs of Jewish history and politics, but let's say that within Judaism, we have those who, who, who dress a certain way. It became standard centuries ago, uh, a certain type of, of uh, outer garment, certain type of headgear. Uh, you know, on special occasions, there's this uh, uh, fur hat and so on, you know, certain kinds of dress that go back, you know, for centuries and now have become standard. And uh, we have people that uh, completely reject, uh, in America we have Christians who completely reject certain aspects of modern technology. Now, modern technology, of course, needs to be utilized appropriately. And, you know, if you personally uh, choose to you know, use or not use a particular uh, appliance or or, or instrument or whatever that's your choice but can't but should you enforce that in an entire community should you just say automatically we you know we should not use this device uh, you know <laughs> uh, let's just stick to the old old uh, way to do it uh, that can be a problem in religion uh, it, 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 we need to dress modestly but it doesn't mean we necessarily have to keep the same styles of dress that, let's say, our great grandparents uh, had. It's possible to to be stylish, but yet at the same time modest, generally speaking. <clears throat> now I realize, you know, in some societies it may become, become be getting more and more difficult. But generally speaking, it is still possible to be stylish and yet not to be violating uh, biblical principles. Uh, uh, again, I want to go to Ecclesiastes. Uh, the seventh chapter, where I was before, but here I want to go now to verse 10, Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 10. Now I realize that among these, these uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews that wear 
this special garb. One reason they do it is because to them it's a uniform. You know, they're in in, in God's army. You know, in their minds, and they ha and they need to wear a particular uniform. But I mean, does the Bible say that? Uh, are you supposed to? We are supposed to be a peculiar people in the sense that we we pay attention to God's word, but we don't have to be odd and 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 weird. Uh, and not that I'm condemn. I'm not picking on them in particular. I'm just saying that. I understand the concept that of maybe wanting to, to to show that that you have a certain commitment, uh, you know, to 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 be, uh, being uh, obedient to God. But He doesn't require us in the Bible to set ourselves apart in in ways that are not essential. You know, in other words, we're we're in the world, but uh, but we're not of the world. But it doesn't mean we have to just all of a sudden, as soon as people you know see us, oh, He's one of them. Let, let them see our good example and say, oh, he's one of them in a positive way. You know, like, like many, many of my brothers and sisters in the church have had the experience of somebody saying, you know, so-and-so is such a wonderful man. So-and-so is such a wonderful woman. It, it's just that they have such a weird religion. In other words, that, you know, as you interact with people, they see your positive example, and maybe they think that your dietary habits are strange or the uh, uh, festivals you keep are, are odd. You know, you're not Jewish, and yet you're keeping these Jewish holidays. And, you know, you're not Jewish, but you're keeping, you know, these, these Jewish dietary laws. Okay, that's one, that's okay, because there you're following God's word. But you don't have to give them additional excuses, you know, to... to, to uh, look at you as strange because you you are deliberately being strange in ways that are not required uh, ho uh, so hopefully i haven't stepped on any toes but uh, you know I've, I've 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 explained that point i want to go to, to uh, ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20 and verse 10 <clears throat> excuse me ecclesiastes 7 and verse 10 do not say why were the former days better than these for you do not inquire wisely concerning this you know, we uh, we can kid ourselves about the good old days, but you know the good old days had their problems. You know, so let's live in, let's live in the present, respecting the past. Yes, of course, we, we that is important. We have a heritage, and then uh, living in the present, and then of course looking forward to the future. Okay, so uh, all of that is important, and these are problems that come up in the realm of religion. Uh, in the realm of music, for example, some people feel like there's only certain kinds of music that, that are appropriate. In the Psalms, we have 30 different titles, uh, roughly. There are different types of music were used in the Psalms. Uh, my son Daniel has a, 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 a talk out that's circulating widely, and I hope it can continue to circulate, which he calls Crisis in Worship Music. And... Uh, He's making a tremendous contribution, so maybe you can check that out. It's on the Flair channel. My son Daniel has a, a talk called Crisis in Worship Music, uh, and so he, he's contributing to the discussion among God-fearing people about our use of music, because that's an important part of, of serving God is, is how, how we use music in, in worship. Now, an additional point, and it, it ties in, it, it, it is related to what I've already covered is the idea of human-made religion. It's hard enough for me to follow what's in the Bible without a lot of adding a lot of other do's and don'ts. Um, uh, let's go to. Uh, I was going to go to. Uh, uh, well, let's go to to Mark to uh, to Mark seven. You can go to Matthew fifteen and see this. Uh, this the, it, it, there's a, a a coverage of it in Matthew 15, but I'll I'll talk about it in Mark 7. Uh, here we have uh, not only are people adding uh, religion uh, religious do's and don'ts that aren't in the Bible, but they're actually undermining do's and don'ts that are in the Bible. So many times people reject God's word and then make up their own. Uh, you know their own uh, for example festivals you reject god's festivals and concoct your own or you reject god's diet dietary laws and concoct your own uh here in, in matthew in in mark 7 uh and verse 7 uh i want to first go to isaiah because uh jesus quotes from isaiah 
So let's go to Isaiah 29 and verse 13. I, I know you just turned to Mark. <laughs> so let's flip back to Isaiah 29. You know, this way at least you'll get more familiar with the books of the Bible. Isaiah 29 and verse 13. Uh, therefore the, the the eternal said in as much as or the Lord said uh, and therefore the Lord said in as much as these people draw near with their mouths it, therefore the Lord said in as much as these people draw near uh, with their mouths and honor me with their lips but have removed their hearts far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men so their religion is, is, is human concocted. Now God has given us a way of life and it's our responsibility to, tr to, to try to understand it and to do it. And as we do it, we come to understand it more and more. You know, the, you know it's, uh, the, uh, Psalm 111 verse 10 tells us that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, a good understanding of all those who do them, meaning of course God's commandments. As we do them, we come to understand and appreciate them. <coughs> Pardon me. But there, there are many religions that have decided they're going to develop their own system of do's and don'ts, added on, tacked on, or sometimes replacing what the Bible says. And so now I do go to Mark 7 and verse 6. Uh, and he's, he's speaking here about Pharisaic traditions. And he, he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, these people, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. So he talked about these many Pharisaic traditions, and of course in my youth I, 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 I observed them. Uh, many of these Pharisaic traditions uh, uh, that... You know the Bible does not require, and yet there, uh, in his day, uh, some of their uh, traditions were actually undermining what God did require. So he would, he in effect was was as a observant Jew was was uh, attempting to reform the 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 system from within. Uh, and I, I could say more about that, but I'll leave it at that. I do want to go to First Timothy four. 1 Timothy 4, and this, this problem is discussed by the, by the Apostle Paul, and he said as we get towards the end of human history, there's going to be this tendency uh, of, of human concocted religion, which, which he even says uh, at times can be dem, you know, demonic in its, in its, in its inspiration. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4, now the Spirit expressly says, that in, la in, latter, in later, latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So, it's it's not you know it's not a sin to be single. The in First Corinthians, uh, I think it's in the seventh chapter where Paul talks about how single people can can have the opportunity to really focus on service in the church because they don't have their their you know the, the, their families to deal with. But generally speaking, of course, the biblical example is to is is pro very pro family. God is building a family, and the Bible from cover to cover is very pro-family and very much in pro-marriage and the bible lays out our diet in terms of what god has created to be to not be consumed you know for he created them for other reasons rather than for you for human consumption and you find that in leviticus 11 and deuteronomy 14 but if you look at the heroes in the bible they ate meat and uh, the two exceptions i can think of regarding wine because they were like lifetime Nazarites, were Samson and, and John the Baptist. But otherwise, God's people uh, in the Bible, the heroes of the Bible, are meat eaters and wine drinkers. Now, if that's not your preference, uh, don't necessarily don't try to require that of the whole community. You know, uh, that's because you're you're going against the Bible if you require that. Frankly, uh, so again. Uh, what I'm saying is is that there are various aspects of life 
that are gray areas, you might say, matters of judgment uh, that, that, that families can, can judge. Uh, and, and we don't necessarily have to sort of rule on them uh, as a community and, and, and add a lot of do's and don'ts that are not in the Bible. You know, sometimes a community does need to make a decision about some questionable practice in order for, for unity and peace in the community. But we have to be very careful in how we do that kind of thing. You know, we, we, we want to approach approach such a such a uh, uh, such an uh, a concept with, with with particularly with particular caution, because we don't want to, as I said, create a human a humanly concocted religion. Now, another uh, problem that occurs in the religious realm. Uh, let me go back and see what we've talked about. Uh, we've talked about. Uh, We've talked about um, deifying people, the cult of personality. We've talked about um, ig uh, ignore, ignoring uh, human nature. We've talked about uh, first. First, we talked about abuse of authority. Then, ignoring human nature. Then, we talked about freezing in time, and then we talked about just uh, in a moment ago. Uh, we talked about a human concocted religion as if <laughs> as if that's not enough to cover I, I want to cover another couple of problems which we find in the realm of religion and uh, if if any of us in positions of responsibility of course have encouraged these kinds of problems or have been been uh, practitioners then we need to repent and, and, and move forward. And if any of us as, as, as uh, members of the church have been guilty of any of these things, then of course we need to repent and move forward. But another problem is, uh, I'll call this maybe spiritual arrogance. You know, lo looking down on others uh, who, who maybe are not maintaining the same standards that we are. And we have to be careful of that. Um, I want to go to Jer uh, Jeremiah the ninth chapter and the 23rd verse uh, Jeremiah 9 Jeremiah 9 and verse 23 I guess some of you are thinking wow he's left preaching and going to meddling you ever heard that expression anyway Jeremiah 9 23 for thus says the eternal let not the wise man glory in his wisdom let not the mighty man glory in his might nor let the rich man glory in his riches but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the eternal, ex exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in, the, righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the eternal. So let's glory in, <laughs> in, in, in the eternal. Let, let's be grateful that we have that opportunity to have a relationship with the eternal and, and not you know, puff up ourselves as if we're something special. Um, I want to go to Luke, the 18th chapter, and the ninth verse, Luke 18 and verse 9. Here we have a very devout person, uh, and, and uh, you know, one who kept the laws and kept a lot of other rules and regulations that, you know, he did, that are not in, in, the, in the law of God. He kept the, the, the rabbinic uh, laws, and, and so I guess he thought of himself as somebody who, you know, was really spiritually speaking a spiritual giant you know let's go to verse 9 of Luke 18 also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and that they were righteous and despised others uh, two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector <laughs> now the tax collectors in those days were not a class of people uh, that were very well respected uh, because they, you know, they were oppressing the people. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified 
rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall, will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, you know, we have to be careful that as we try to maintain proper standards, we don't, you know, as, as I said, look down on others. Uh, we need, you know, we need, we need to be looking at our own situation, our own condition, and working on ourselves and overcoming ourselves. You know, there, there, there's the um, expression that when you point your finger at some at someone, there's three pointing right back at you. You probably heard that expression. Uh, I want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Uh, I used to speak a lot in various churches, and once in a while, uh, after I would speak, they would turn to a hymn, not many wise men now are called, not many noble brethren. And my children used to make a joke about that. Well, Dad would give a talk, and then they would sing about not many wise men now are called. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, uh, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen the things and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Uh, and I, I want to say that many, of, many people who, who become devout Christians are not the VIPs of this world. Uh, but but if they have certain failings, it doesn't mean they need to stay that way. You, you know, we, we can work on ourselves and develop ourselves. You know, for example, um, I I was I was in in a in an organized uh, religious body that had a, a, a speech club for uh, a men's speech club, and it trained it trained men to frankly be better men in many ways. And I realize I'm saying something quite controversial in 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 the Western world of of this age, but they train you know men to be to be better men, uh, and um, it, it, it helped it helped to develop also speakers within the community, uh, so that people maybe who had not developed those skills were able to develop those skills, and of course they they they're also uh, they there also were programs to to uh, you know to help. Uh, you know, families to, to develop and so on. Um, and uh, in, in there, we had uh, colleges where we had uh, uh, clubs where um, women could get together and, and, and uh, focus on being better women because you, 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 there is a role for men in a community and a role for women that are not always, always the same. You know, there are certain, I mean, you know, women, a after all, Again, I'm saying something very controversial. And nowadays, it would have been very basic, uh, even not so many years ago, to understand that you know women give birth, women carry the, the the child and give birth to the child and nurture the child, and generally in most societies spend more time around the child because it is the man's responsibility to support the family. It, nowadays, in many cases, both are doing that, but it is. De uh, it is certainly something the man is is, is is his responsibility to do, and you know. In fact, I'll go to First Timothy five on that. Um, let's go to First Timothy the uh, fifth chapter, and you, you know where I'm going. I'm going to First Timothy five and five and verse eight. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You know, so particularly, you know, that's where the word husband comes from in English. You know, the, 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 the man, the man what, whatever uh, the family has to, is required to do, a man has a responsibility, if at all possible. I realize you, there could be health issues and so on. I understand. But I'm saying in general, uh, if, if if you're capable, if you're able, a man has a responsibility to support the family. So anyway, what what we were trying to do in that community was help men to be better men and help women to be better women. And uh, so, as I said, it, whatever our background when we come into the church, we can continue to develop ourselves and improve ourselves. But now I want to go back to First Corinthians one and verse twenty nine, verse thirty. But of him, but of but of him. Uh, let's let, let's go in verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us 
wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So, you know, our wisdom comes because of the fact that we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That is really the wisest way to live. And as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the eternal. Going back to Jeremiah, what I read earlier in Jeremiah 9. Okay, now the final point, uh, and, and again, I realize I'm today I may be uh, stepping on some toes, time will tell. But as I said, all of us, including myself, if we, if we have been guilty in any of these areas, you know, we can repent and overcome. That's what the Bible teaches. But the Bible wants us to be aware of these tendencies. You know, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, saying anything that's not scriptural. These are tendencies, problems in the realm of religion, in the religious realm. The final one is pushing the end, is, is uh, in effect uh, artificially um, getting people to somehow believe that you know the end is near you know the the climax of human history is is right is right around the corner uh, that that is that is irresponsible the, the bible has a lot of details about end time prophecy we have to respect we have to tremble before the word of god we have to respect the prophecies in the bible and 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 not just try to stir up uh, you know artificial excitement about the end time uh, you know, as I said, it is not spiritually responsible to do that. Um, I want to go to um, Matthew 24. Here is the Olivet Prophecy. Here is the, you know, where Christ tells us what the signs are uh, be, uh, before he, he's coming back. And uh, in Matthew 24, in verse 6, here is what he says. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Okay, so let's realize that. Uh, when the, these things, he says, are going to happen, and when they do happen, see that you're not troubled because the end, all these things are going to happen and the end is not yet. Uh, I want to go to Mark 7. That doesn't mean we shouldn't want, uh, of course we want Jesus Christ to return. We pray every day, your kingdom come. You know, obviously that, that is that is our hope, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, but you know, we're uh, we can pray for for that day to come, but we shouldn't be um, not putting together the, the 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 database we have, the scriptures that we have, and to try to understand uh, some idea of the outline of events that must occur according to the Bible before Jesus Christ returns. So we're not irresponsibly getting people all aroused as, as has happened throughout history, uh, as we know, uh, you know, where people have been, uh, are, you know, stirred up to think the end w was, was near and, and, and it didn't come. And, and so there are repercussions of that. Um, in, uh, in Mark 13, did I say Mark 7? I meant to say Mark 13, and very likely verse 7, or thereabouts. Uh, Mark 13 and verse uh, 7, okay? But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. So again, this is a problem in the realm of religion, where, where we, 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 we want to push... Uh, the end time, and uh, it's a way of, of, of stirring up, in a way, artificial enthusiasm, you know, so maybe, you know, I suppose it has, it has a temporary benefit, because people get more alert spiritually, more disciplined, because they think that, you know, we're right near the end, but then what happens when time goes on, and things don't come to a head, and then it, it, it can lead to a precipitous decline. And I've seen it happen in a community. You know, my, uh, I and my family lived through it. Uh, you know, so we, we want to be balanced and we want to have respect for God's word. We want to pray your kingdom come, but we also want to be aware of what the Bible says is going to happen uh, before Christ return, the various events that have to occur. And, and some of them I, I, we can read about and, and understand that we probably don't fully grasp uh, how, how, how they're going to work out. We, we can read the prophecies, but I, I know there are some prophecies that I, that I personally wrestle with, wondering how, could, how are these going to be fulfilled, in what way are they going to be fulfilled. And when, as we get closer to the events, you know, God will, will reveal uh, how, how, how these things are going to come to pass. And, and, and another related thought is that when World War I broke out, 
you didn't need uh, some some special insight to know the world was at war and when your country is having economic difficulties you don't need some secret newsletter to tell you so when these end time events are occurring you're not going to have to be on some special uh, channel or some uh, special um, mailing list you know to know that we're in the middle of these end time events you should be in a in a community with a spiritual leader who will help you understand the significance of the events and what you want to do about it but you're not going to uh you're not going to need uh to be told you know that things are you know that things are, are, are that the world is collapsing around you you'll know it what you'll need is leadership on how to deal with it you know and the significance of the events and how to deal with them so I hope that I've been helpful in that regard. That I'm trying to be helpful. I want to now conclude by, uh, I am concluding now, so settle down. Um, I'm going to go to Philippians, the first chapter. The Philippians, the first chapter. So as, as I started this talk, in, in, I'll say that in various realms of life, problems can occur. They can occur in the economic realm. You know, they can occur in, in the artistic realm and so on and so forth. In the political realm, there can be problems, and there can be problems in the religious realm. And I've talked about the kind of problems that come up in the world of religion today, and I hope that uh, it, it's helped us to, to get an insight uh, and, and a, a certain clarity about the kinds of things that have happened, can happen, and probably, unfortunately, will happen in the world of religion, and so we can be alert to these tendencies and, and properly deal with them. And remember that we who are uh, a part of God's church, if we have received the Spirit of God, if we have a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, whatever these problems are that I've talked about, they can be overcome. Uh, a community can overcome them. An individual can overcome them. And we do have a as I say from week to week, a very positive future. So we need to be aware of the pitfalls and we can overcome them. And with God's help, we will. Philippians 1 and verse 6 is where I'd like to conclude. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. All the best to you and yours.